This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. The True Crime Podcast Festival is on Saturday, July 13th at the Marriott Downtown, right on the Magnificent Mile. There will be over 80 true crime podcasters there. Go to truecrimepodcastfestival.com to get your tickets. I'll see you there. If you're interested, you can join the Beyond Contempt True Crime Discussion Group on Facebook. The link is in the show notes. If you have the means and are interested in supporting the show, I'm on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash beyond contempt podcast. But the best way to support the show is to tell a friend or share this episode on social media. Now, let's get on to the show. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. Today we have an unusual story of an FBI agent who became entangled with his informant. She disappeared and did not tell one person where she went, including her sister. This informant had several enemies that might have caused her harm because of her work with the FBI. She was missing for a year and the whole case unraveled when local authorities pressured the FBI to investigate her disappearance. You are listening to Episode 10, the murder of Susan Daniel Smith. Mark Putnam and Kathy Ponticelli had both grown up in Connecticut. They met right after Mark finished college. He took a job as a clerk in the FBI office in New Haven, Connecticut. They eloped in 1984. Mark had always wanted to be an FBI agent. After he put in four years working as a clerk, he applied to the FBI but they rejected him because of a shoulder surgery he underwent for a soccer injury. They said that he would be too much of a liability. Kathy Putnam was a tenacious woman and a loyal supporter of her husband. She spent hours on the phone trying to get someone at the Justice Department who could help her. She explained that they had been around FBI agents for four years when Mark clerked in New Haven, and many of those agents were fat guys who couldn't run a city block if their life depended on it. Mark was a physical specimen. He ran every night and lifted weights. Kathy told them that Mark would have no problem with the physicality of FBI agent training, and they would sign a release to take the legal burden off the bureau. The FBI allowed Mark in, and one week after graduating the academy, they sent him to his first assignment in Pikeville, Kentucky. It was 1987. Kathy was 27, and Mark was only a few months older. The Pikeville FBI office was small, and always without supervision. It was a two-agent office and was three hours away from the larger regional office in Lexington. FBI life in Pikeville was not glamorous. It was basically a sleeper office that no one cared about. A senior agent from the main office in Louisville greeted Mark in Pikeville. He told Mark that he would really be better off in a central office, like Lexington, where senior agents would teach and monitor him. The FBI didn't expect much out of the Pikeville office because it was a mess. All the paperwork and filing were disorganized. But the FBI knew Mark was gung-ho, and they thought he might do well. He was perfectly positioned as a former clerk to organize Pikeville, even though it was not a desirable assignment. Mark reported to his first day of work in February 1987. The office was one small room in a federal building on Main Street. There was no secretary or administrative assistant. Kathy, being the supportive wife she was, acted as Mark's assistant. She took calls and messages on their home phone line. Mark's first case began right after he started. Prior to his arrival, someone had robbed a bank in a small unincorporated town called Meta. The robber took $18,000. The FBI received a tip from a woman who knew her husband committed this crime because he came home with a large sum of money. Mark asked the woman why she was turning on him. Her response was, the SOB won't share it with her. When Mark asked her to clarify her relationship to this man, she thought that they were married. The woman pulled a note out of the bedroom drawer. She couldn't read it because she was illiterate. Mark saw that their names were written out on the paper, 
Mark thought they found their robber. A veteran FBI agent warned Mark not to jump to conclusions so fast. When they interviewed the so-called husband, he said he went to the courthouse to file for a divorce with another woman who was his actual wife. The woman in the trailer named him as the robber because it upset her he had not married her. Mark learned an important lesson with his case. Vengeance, retribution, and hidden agendas can motivate suspects. Consider all possibilities when assessing people. Unlike many of his predecessors, Mark created a good working relationship with local patrol cops by taking part in ride-alongs. This introduced him to the town, and he gained their respect by not being afraid to get his hands dirty. The FBI had deep pockets when it came to paying for information. Once the word was out, information headed to Mark, and he no longer had to seek it out. He created a network of informants quickly. Many of the local banks were mom-and-pop businesses. They were independent establishments that allowed the townspeople to cash their welfare checks, deposit their paychecks, and cash their coal miner union pensions. Drug dealers depended on these mountain banks to stash their earnings. In the 1980s, security for these banks was virtually non-existent, based on today's standards. That summer, there was an excess of bank robberies, and they were all similar. The perpetrator had a ski mask and a sawed-off shotgun. Local officer Bert Hatfield suspected Carl Edward Cat-Eyes Lockhart. He was a handsome young man with vivid green eyes, which is where his nickname originated. This spike in robberies coincided with Carl's release from prison, where he served seven years of an 18-year sentence for robbing banks. He had taken $300,000 from a bank and spent all the money in three months as he traveled all around. They arrested Cat Eyes when he returned home. He had wanted to be a bank robber since he was a little boy. He enjoyed flashing his money around and even purchased a Pontiac Firebird Trans Am just like the one in Smokey and the Bandit. Cat's favorite place to hang out was a small home where Kenneth Smith and his ex-wife, Susan Daniel Smith, lived. They had divorced a few years earlier, but stayed together for their two kids. Kenneth supplied Susan with drugs, so that was the reason she continued to live with him. Carl was very generous with his money and never hid it. He had a likable personality, causing people to open up their homes to this outlaw. Kenneth Smith asked Carl if he and his girlfriend, Sherry Justice, wanted to stay with them since they had been living in a tent in a family member's backyard. Cat Eyes enjoyed bragging, so he talked about bank robbing techniques and strategies while sitting around the Smith's kitchen table. Mark Putnam wanted to use Kenneth Smith as an informant, but Kenneth had way too many demands and was an unreliable person, according to his parole officer. Local officer, Bert Hatfield, suggested Mark try to use Kenneth's ex-wife, Susan. But he warned Mark that Susan liked to run her mouth and didn't always tell the truth. Susan had been growing tired of putting up with Cat Eyes and his girlfriend in her home. Cat Eyes had spent all the bank robbery money and was broke. He would run up their phone bill, always calling his long-distance prison friends. He ate a lot of food and needed gas money for his car. Plus, there was tension in the house between Susan and Cat's girlfriend. Susan was a beautiful woman, and Cat Eyes flirted with her right in front of his girlfriend. Susan was opposed to being an informant because one of her relatives had helped the FBI, then never got the money as promised. Susan was running a standard area welfare scam. She collected welfare checks from both West Virginia and Kentucky, but it wasn't enough. Susan needed informant money, and Cat Eyes had overstayed his welcome. Mark and Susan met several times a week. From Mark's training at the FBI, he learned what motivates informants, money, greed, and revenge. A sense of duty motivated a few. The most important part of FBI training was not to get involved with your informant on a personal level. The reality of the situation was that an agent had to get personal with an informant to develop a relationship that would cultivate usable information for the FBI. Mark, being a green agent, was cautious about spending the government's money. He put in a request for $500 to give to his informant and received a call from the FBI office in Cincinnati. They wanted to know if Mark was sure about this informant. 
Then they asked Mark why he wanted to only give her $500 and told him to give her more money. The FBI wanted Mark to understand that the money was at his disposal and not to skimp on paying informants. So the next meeting he had with Susan, he gave her the $500. This transaction had shaken her, and this was outside of the norm of her confident personality. This money was a significant moment in the relationship. Susan had taken the money and was officially an informant. There was no turning back. Tri-Corner is where West Virginia, Kentucky, and Virginia meet. Jobs are scarce, making it one of the poorest places in the United States. This area was the home of the Hatfields and McCoys, the famous family feud that took place in the Tug Valley between West Virginia and Kentucky. These feuding families are what many of us associate with Appalachian mountain culture. Susan Smith's family tree was closely linked to this culture since her mom's family were McCoys and her father's family were Hatfields. Susan was the fifth out of nine children. Her father was an unemployed coal miner who liked his alcohol. Susan had grown up poor. Her family had been on welfare for her entire life. Susan did not like it, and it made her feel ashamed. Susan was a cheerleader in junior high, but never quite made it to high school. She dropped out of school at the end of seventh grade. It was not uncommon for that area. Only one out of four high school kids graduated in Pike County. In some backwoods mountain areas, the graduation rate might be as low as 7%. Susan had developed a reputation of being unreliable and sometimes told lies. She craved attention and would brag about anything. Susan was into drugs, but at that point wasn't drug-addled. At age 15, she dated 22-year-old Kenneth Smith. When Kenneth first saw Susan, he wolf-whistled her. She hopped on the back of his motorcycle, and that started their relationship. They lived in his trailer on the far side of the mountain. He was a local successful meth dealer. Susan was a smart woman. She was quick with the numbers and had a sharp memory. She helped Kenneth with drug deals and called herself Kenneth's executive assistant. When Susan was 17, they arrested Kenneth for drug possession. He bailed out of jail and ran. In the meantime, Susan went to live with Kenneth's brother and wife. She was broke and unhappy. Susan tried working in a fast food restaurant, but the pay was terrible, so she turned to trading sex for money occasionally to make ends meet. There was a warrant out for Kenneth, so he surrendered and worked out a deal. Once he left prison, Kenneth went legitimate and became a construction worker. Susan and Kenneth married when she was 19 years old. Kenneth sustained a back injury and decided he could no longer work. A doctor thought Kenneth was not permanently injured and would not help him with a disability claim. Kenneth went back to dealing drugs. He fought a lot with Susan and beat her, then apologized in the sober light of the next day. This pattern continued throughout their relationship. They moved around and ended up living outside of Chicago for a while. Kenneth established drug contacts that would keep him supplied when he moved back to Pikeville. Kenneth and Susan had two kids. Miranda was the older, and Brady was the youngest. They got divorced because it would bring in more welfare money. Carl Cadeye's Lockhart was Kenneth's best friend and stayed at their house just around the time Mark Putnam entered Susan's life. At the end of summer, she brought Mark some useful information that Cadeye's came home with a duffel bag that contained ski masks and sawed-off shotguns. He was planning his next robbery. On September 15th, He had a bank 15 miles south of Pikeville. The branch administrator had worked at the bank for over a decade and was filling in for the teller that day. Cat Eyes handed her an old pillowcase and commanded her to fill it up. When he turned around to tell everyone to put their hands up, the teller slipped a dye pack into the pillowcase with the money. When Cat Eyes took the teller into the vault, she attempted to slip in another dye pack, but he caught that one. He had $12,807, $182 bills, and one 10 spot that masked the dye pack. Cat Eyes ran to the exit, and the red dye pack exploded, 
At first he thought they shot him, but realized it was the die, and ran to the getaway van. Cat Eyes didn't return to the Smith's house because the police were watching it. A few days later, he went to a Pikeville bank to trade in all 182 $2 bills. The teller was immediately suspicious, since there was red dye on the edges of many of the bills, plus it was an odd request. She called the police who notified the FBI. Susan told Mark Putnam that Cat Eyes was hiding at his mom's house in West Virginia. Mark arrested Carl Cat Eyes Lockhart, but the newspaper gave another FBI agent the credit. Mark paid Susan $1,500 for her work on the case. She refused to take the money and wanted Mark to have it because he deserved the credit. It upset her that the newspaper got it wrong. This made Mark nervous, and he again called the main office to ask what he should do. They had him put the money in a safe with a memo, and then this money would go to Susan for later work. When Mark asked Susan to testify against Cat Eyes, she was afraid for her life. She told Mark she needed $4,000 to move her and her kids out of the area. He told her it was no problem, and the FBI would handle it. Susan was telling everyone in town that she was working for the FBI. She said that she was Mark Putnam's executive secretary. Kathy Putnam had a lot of empathy for Susan, even though she knew that Susan was one to pounce when she saw an opportunity. Kathy could tell that her husband enchanted Susan. But Kathy was lonely and unhappy in Kentucky. She enjoyed when Susan called because she had someone to talk to. Susan would ask Kathy advice on various topics and subtly probe for personal information on Mark. Kathy told her that Mark ran every night, so Susan ran too. Mark enjoyed reading, so she showed up to their meetings with a book in her hand. As the weeks went on, Susan asked for more personal information. What were they having for dinner? What did Mark like to eat? Sometimes Kathy and Susan would talk for hours on the phone. When Mark was out of town, Kathy often fueled these chats with a healthy dose of wine. They would talk about relationships or money problems. Kathy would always tell Susan that she had overcome a lot of the same issues Susan has, and Susan could too. Most people wouldn't think a troubled Appalachian woman with a drug problem has much in common with an FBI agent's wife. But Kathy had a past that few people knew about. Kathy dropped out of high school in her junior year. She had a boyfriend that had striking similarities to Kenneth. Kathy moved in with that heavy-drinking boyfriend into a crime-ridden housing project. She took a job as a waitress where her boyfriend's mom was a bartender and the bar featured go-go dancers. Her boyfriend was the jealous type and went to jail for fighting a man who flirted with her. Kathy was so naive back then she took a job in a massage parlor where she thought the staff only gave men back rubs in the private rooms. When clients asked for more, she would tell them that they had to give themselves a hand job. Kathy only lasted a week. Before she quit that job, a client followed her home. He pushed his way into her apartment and raped Kathy. She reported the rape to her boss at the massage parlor. Since the man who raped her was a regular, her boss was worried about getting the cops involved with the illegal business he was running. He didn't really seem worried about Kathy's well-being, so she reported the rape to the police. They arrested the man, but brought him into the same room with Kathy. He wasn't wearing handcuffs because police wanted to see her reaction. Law enforcement didn't trust Kathy because she worked at the parlor. There wasn't much of a case because it came down to her word versus his. Kathy went into protective custody. Shortly after, the rapist went looking for Kathy and showed up at her apartment with a bunch of other men. She wasn't there, so they trashed her apartment, and that is when the cops arrested him. They didn't charge him with rape because they were more concerned about busting the massage parlor. Kathy moved with her boyfriend into a trailer in North Carolina. She wanted to go home, but the bartender job didn't pay enough to get her there. Kathy set up a street hustle. She propositioned five young military men and said she had five ladies waiting for them at the hotel. 
They needed to give her money up front, and then she would take them to meet the women. They handed Kathy the 200 bucks, and she took off. She was driving away with her boyfriend when police pulled them over. They arrested and charged her with prostitution. She went to jail for a few days, but her parents hired an attorney, and they dropped the charges against her. Kathy's parents took her back, but she had to follow their rules. A man 10 years older than Kathy had come into her life, and she impulsively married him. During that time, she received her GED and went to community college. Her new husband was deeply flawed. It upset him that Kathy was attending college. After four months of marriage, he got drunk, smacked Kathy around, and pushed her out of the car, battered and half-naked, onto her parents' front yard. By age 21, Kathy was divorced. She had an associate's degree. She had a good job, a decent apartment, and a car. She had really changed her life around. Kathy was out at a restaurant when a woman struck up a conversation and knew her son would be perfect for her. Her son, Mark Putnam, just graduated from college and would be an FBI agent soon. Mark and Kathy talked on the phone. When they met in person, they fell in love right away and quickly moved in together. Mark took a clerk job in the FBI office in New Haven, and Kathy took a paralegal job at an insurance company. When marriage came up, Kathy told Mark about her past. He sat in silence and listened to her, then disappeared for three days. Kathy thought that she would never see him again. Mark came back to her and said that he never wanted to talk about any of it again. They only spoke about it when they thought her misdemeanor would come up during an FBI background check, but it never did, and it wasn't a problem. Susan, being the street-smart woman that she was, would later tell Kathy that nothing came up because it was an ACD, adjournment with contemplation of dismissal, and it meant they wiped your record clean if you don't do it again. They promoted Mark to night clerk, where he fielded FBI agents after hours phone tips and edited their reports. Kathy and Mark eloped in New York City on Easter weekend in 1984. Their first child, Danielle, was born on New Year's Day in 1985. One and a half years later, Mark was accepted into the FBI Academy. One month after they left for his first assignment in Pikefield, Danielle was two and Kathy was pregnant with her second child. Charlie Trotter told Mark about stolen vehicles, parts, and construction equipment at this massive chop shop in the mountains in a nearby town. He explained the operation and who the players were. Charlie wanted to know if the FBI was interested, but it would cost them. Charlie had a record. Drugs, robbery, and attempted murder, which didn't make him a bad informant, but Mark took him with a grain of salt. The promise of FBI money and revenge motivated him. He hadn't been paid for the last vehicle he had brought into the chop shop. Mark and Charlie met one to two times per week. Mark was also meeting with Susan frequently, and Susan called the Putnam house almost daily. Mark was concerned about Susan's intense interest in his life, but he had to maintain the relationship because he needed her to testify against cat eyes, and the FBI wanted to use her for other criminal matters in the area. Kathy told Susan that she had cut her hair short. Several days later, Susan cut her hair short and asked Mark if her hair looked like Kathy's, the FBI finally had enough evidence to raid the chop shop, but when they arrived, no one was there. Someone had tipped the crew off. Mark prepared the case by photographing and logging all the parts' identification numbers. He worked on this for weeks. The site was constantly broken into, and they stole parts. Mark even spent nights on site in a sleeping bag, hoping to catch the thieves. One of these criminals was so bold, he walked up to Mark and shook his hand. He informed Mark that they were untouchable and had many local officials on the payroll. Even an anonymous source said one of the local cops had been selling CB radios from the site. Mark's informant, Charlie Trotter, had been jumped when he was drunk, and a few men carved an X on his back. His cover was blown, and no arrests had been made yet. This didn't deter Charlie because he had taken $11,000 from Mark for the information he provided. 
which he had swiftly blown on women and cocaine. Had it not been for his work as an informant, he would have been unemployed. Kathy had flown back to Connecticut with her daughter because she wanted her previous doctor she had known and trusted to deliver their second child. Mark flew back in December of that year for the birth of a son, Mark Jr. The whole family flew back to Pikeville after Christmas. Susan visited him at the office and gave him a Christmas present of running shoes and a Nike t-shirt. Mark told her that he could not accept those things. Susan said that it would insult her if he didn't take the gift. Mark took the items awkwardly, as to not hurt her feelings, and he called the Covington office to ask for advice. Again, he was told to write a memo explaining the situation and put everything into the safe. But his supervisors also wanted to know what was going on with this girl. Mark said that she made her intentions known, that she wanted to be with him. His supervisor wasn't concerned, but said to continue to do good work and ensure she testified against cat eyes at his trial. Mark was looking forward to the trial and then not having to work with Susan anymore once it concluded. When he drove Susan home one night, she told him she had run like him and lost 10 pounds. She asked him if he was interested in a fling. He turned her down and drove her home. Mark was a real catch, especially for that area. His first month in Kentucky, a bank teller passed him a note with her number, which said to call any time. Carl Cadiz Lockhart maintained his innocence at his trial. He claimed he was arrested and unfairly accused because of his past bank robberies he already served time for. Susan Smith testified and had identified the sawed-off shotgun she saw in her home which was key for the prosecutor's case. The trial was straightforward. They found Cat Eyes guilty, and he went back to prison. He refused to believe that Susan had testified on her own free will. Cat Eyes was in love with Susan, and he had assumed that Kenneth had put her up to it. Mark's current FBI partner was set to be transferred out of the Pikeville office, and Ronald Jean Poole would be Mark's new partner. Ron was 37 and was from Chicago, he handled mostly drug cases and did a lot of undercover work. Mark was hoping to pawn Susan off onto Poole since most of her tips were drug-related and Mark wasn't interested in working drug cases. Ron was obese and he weighed over 300 pounds. He did not look like an FBI agent, which probably helped him succeed in undercover work. Poole's appearance and attitude turned Mark off. He sensed that they might struggle to work together. Mark speculated that the FBI superiors transferred Poole to Kentucky because they preferred to not have a lot of interaction with him. Mark was really hoping to have a partner he could learn things from, but he would not have that with Ronald Poole. Kathy forced Mark to invite Poole to dinner to make him feel welcome. He opened up to Kathy about his weight problem and how his previous supervisor brought a bathroom scale into the office. He made Poole weigh in every day so Kathy explained her diet and exercise routine to Ron. He looked her over and commented on how successful her approach was. Mark made a mental note about how his new partner enjoyed leering at his wife. A few nights later, Poole called Kathy to borrow a diet book. When she answered the phone out of breath because she had been exercising, Poole suggestively asked, Breathing heavy? She brushed him off, but it later dawned on her that Poole might have been jealous of Mark. Poole called her a few days later and wanted to check in with Kathy, since Mark was working late and she was home alone with the kids. Poole had joined Susan Smith and Charlie Trotter in the lineup of people who regularly talk with Kathy in the evenings. Mark's supervisor cautioned him against passing Susan off to Poole. Few informants testify. He told Mark to hang on to her and he was lucky to get an informant who helped his career like she had. Mark's next case would involve political corruption, politicians, judges, and sheriffs that were taking kickbacks and shaking down and extorting citizens. Susan just brought Mark a bunch of drugs from a politician who passed out those drugs in exchange for votes. She also had information about another bank robbery. Cat Eyes had an uncle who told Susan about his plans, even though she had testified against his nephew. 
because he was attracted to her. Susan had provided the uncle with a gun for the robbery to prove that she wasn't working for the FBI. Mark did not believe Susan and thought she was telling tall tales as she was prone to do. He was out of town on FBI business when he got a call from Ronald Poole, and sure enough, the bank robbery happened. Mark told Poole to call Susan, which he gladly did. When Poole talked to Kathy on the phone, he clarified that he was interested in Susan. Kathy warned Poole about Susan because her life was increasingly disheveled, and she had ramped up the amount of drugs she was using. Poole told Kathy that he could take care of himself. Susan didn't want to work with Poole, but she had no choice. She needed money to get her and her kids into an apartment and away from Kenneth. Poole took investigative trips where he and Susan always ended up alone together. Susan turned him down every single time, but it worried her that he would financially cut her off. Mark had expected to transfer out of Kentucky after two years, but the FBI cut back on spending. Now it might be four or five years. It devastated Kathy since she hated it there. Susan was falling into a deep depression. She ramped up her drug use, which was partially fueled by Mark's indifference to her. She was telling everyone she knew that Mark was leaving his wife for her and that he was in love with her. Susan's family was also not happy that she was working with the FBI. Some family members stopped speaking with her. Her sister, Shelby Jean Ward, told her that she should not be working with that Yankee cop. The rumors about Mark and Susan had been circulating. Kathy even received phone calls that revealed her husband and Susan were fooling around. Trouble was mounting in the Putnam household. Mark had problems all day long at work. Then he came home to an unhappy Kathy who hated Kentucky. She would tell him they needed to leave and all he did was work too much and care about his job. Susan's calls to Kathy became more distraught. In one call, Susan told Kathy how close her and Mark had become, and that she likes to feel him near her. Kathy would try to reinforce with her husband to be careful and not get too closely involved with Susan. Mark would brush Kathy off as if she were insulting him. Kathy would take calls and tell Susan that Mark wasn't there, even when he was. Mark provided Susan with another $4,000 because Kathy advocated for her. Unfortunately, Susan didn't use that money to move out. Kenneth took half of it for drug debts he said Susan owed him. She took the other half of the money and invested it into a car. Susan spent many nights at her sister Shelby's house. She told her sister that her and Mark were in love. She said he takes her to motels and even to his home where they have sex until dawn. Susan said she was pregnant, but had a miscarriage. Most people knew that Susan could only be trusted to tell the truth half the time. One day, Mark was chopping wood at his house. A horn honked, and when he looked up, it was Ron Poole and Susan. Mark ignored them and walked into the house. Later, Mark confronted Poole and told him to never bring an informant to his house ever again. The chop shop case was still ongoing. A neighbor warned Kathy that Mark should be careful because they shot her brother in that area in the mountains. They let all the air out of Mark's tires and it was likely someone connected to that case sending him a message. Mark's career was putting Kathy on edge. That same day, Kathy was staring out her window as she was preparing a bottle for their baby. A man looked through the window at her. She dropped the milk and ran to grab the three fifty seven. She told the stranger not to move as she pointed the gun at him. It turned out he was just the cable man. She lowered the gun and told him that he was a dumb hillbilly. She wanted to know why he didn't ring the doorbell like a normal person would. Mark had come home and defused the situation. It worried him that his wife almost shot an innocent man. Mark showed the kid his FBI badge and asked him if he thought it would be a better approach to go through the front door instead of looking into windows. The kid said, yes, sir. Once the cable man left, Mark had a talk with Kathy. He wondered how she could have become so afraid. They got into a big blowout. Kathy got in the car and drove off. When she came home, the phone rang, and it was Susan. This time she said that Mark was home. 
she handed him the phone and walked away. Poole lectured Kathy and told her that all Mark had to do was tell his supervisor they've received threats and the FBI would transfer them. Poole was correct, even though this was a self-serving suggestion. He didn't like Mark because Mark was an overachieving agent who made him look bad. Kathy's sister flew into Kentucky and offered to babysit the kids. Mark and Kathy went out for dinner and drinks. Mark saw a politician he knew was involved in cocaine dealing. Mark stepped away, and Kathy flirted with the politician to get him talking. She played it up that her husband had worked a lot, and she never got attention. Kathy steered the conversation to cocaine and said she did it back east. The politician pressed a wrinkled plastic bag into her hand, which contained about two grams of coke. When Kathy showed Mark the drugs, he insisted they drive to the FBI office, and he called his supervisor. He told Mark to have Poole come down to the office to witness Mark secure the cocaine into the safe, along with the politician's name and number he had written on a napkin for Kathy. Now the FBI wanted to set up a sting. They had Kathy on the phone with the politician, trying to get him to incriminate himself. He was too smart for that and didn't bite. Later, Susan rang the Putnam house and told Kathy about the whole operation. Poole had shared all kinds of sensitive information about the sting and about Kathy calling the politician from her house. Luckily, the Justice Department rejected involving Kathy further in any FBI business. Mark drove Susan out to a remote mountaintop road. He wanted to talk to her about the next drug setup that was taking place in Chicago. Susan said something was wrong with Mark, and she wanted him to relax. He considered his unhappy station in life with his marriage to Kathy falling apart. Susan rubbed Mark's neck. She kissed him as she stroked the inside of his thigh and told him that they should have sex. Mark told her it wouldn't be a good idea. Susan said it was too late for all of that. They had sex for the first time in his car. When it was over, he tried to push the situation out of his mind. Mark wanted to pretend like it was one of those things, like a girl he picked up at a bar in college, a one-and-done. But a few days later, he did the same thing with her again, in the same place and in the same car. To this day, Mark claims they only had sex five times over two weeks and only in his car. Mark avoided Susan and shut her completely out of his life. Kathy suspected nothing was going on with her husband, but around Christmas that year, she sensed a change in Susan. She hadn't called the house as much, and when she called, they spoke about topics other than Mark. Kenneth called Kathy one night and told her that Susan and Mark were screwing. Susan grabbed the phone and told Kathy not to believe him. Kathy heard a tussle on the other end of the phone line. Kenneth got back on the phone and said that Susan was pregnant from Mark but lost the baby. When Mark woke up and got on the phone, Kenneth hung up. Kathy confronted Mark, and his only response was that he was so sick of Susan and he can only trust a fraction of what she said. Kathy did not sleep that night, and this was the first time she ever doubted her husband. They had finally secured the indictments for the chop shop case. Poole was calling Kathy again and encouraging her to have Mark make the case for a transfer out of Kentucky. Especially since the judge allowed the accused men to go free on bail and ordered them to stay away from the Putnam family. The transfer orders were placed, and within a few days, the Putnams were reassigned to Miami. The family moved in the spring of 1989. Within a few weeks, Poole called Mark in Miami. Susan was too difficult for him to handle, and he wanted help. She also told people she was pregnant with Mark's child. She repeatedly called Mark in Florida and left messages on their answering machine. She even left messages that said she was pregnant, but did not say who the father was. Kathy was getting annoyed with all the calls, and she wasn't sure why Susan was calling them now since they left Kentucky. Susan was sick of being abused by Kenneth, and finally filed charges against him. As for retribution, 
he reported her to the welfare office in West Virginia, since she was collecting checks from there and Kentucky. Susan announced to anyone who would listen that she was on a secret undercover drug mission for the FBI. Because of this, all of her drug sources dried up, and she had a hard time finding cocaine and amphetamines. Cat Eye's girlfriend, Cherry Justice, incidentally ran into Susan and beat her up for testifying against her boyfriend. Susan was getting desperate and turned to Poole, who was telling her that Mark Putnam caused all her problems. Susan finally called Mark and told him that she was pregnant with his child. He told Susan that he had to fly back to Kentucky to wrap up on the chop shop case, and they would talk then. Mark had thought he made a mistake with Susan, but he had gotten away with it. But that call from her destroyed any notion he left Pikeville, Kentucky in the rearview mirror. Susan went to the doctor to have an official pregnancy test. The doctor told her her due date was November 19th, with an estimated conception date of February. The doctor also noted that she miscarried in January. Susan took the report to Poole, who made a photocopy. When Mark boarded the flight to Kentucky, he had a deep sense of dread and was upset with himself that he never considered the consequences. He had disgraced himself, his family, and the FBI. Mark's flight landed in Huntington, West Virginia, which was the closest airport to Pikeville. He rented a car and drove the rest of the way. Ron Poole decided that he should reunite Susan and Mark so they could discuss their problems. He picked up Susan and got her a room at the Landmark Motel. This was the same motel where informant Charlie Trotter was staying while he waited to testify. Just as Mark arrived at the FBI office, Poole was on the phone with Susan and handed the receiver to Mark. She needed to know if they could meet soon. Mark assured her that they would, Susan said that they better meet soon because he had screwed her over. Mark had wondered what had been going on between Poole and Susan. She had always been civil and polite with Mark, but this new version of Susan was agitated and hostile. He looked at the document on his desk, and it was a signed note from the Pike County Health Center confirming Susan's pregnancy. Mark felt sick. This was out of control, and if Poole knew... Who else did? Mark had never thought to bring a condom and didn't know if Susan was on birth control. The sex they had was spontaneous, and he was likely the father. The next day, Mark drove to Lexington to get some work done with the U.S. Attorney's Office. When he returned to the motel, he heard banging on the door. It was Susan. She was high and hostile. Mark offered to take her for a bite to eat at McDonald's, and she settled down to the old Susan he knew, polite and cordial. They ate in the car and talked about the beatings from Kenneth and Cat Eye's girlfriend. She had money problems and lost her children to Kenneth. Poole was pressuring her to work with him, which was really more about him trying to get with her, and she also talked about the pregnancy. Mark asked if she would consider an abortion. Susan said, not a chance. Then she became hostile again. She told Mark that she would go down to Florida to make sure that he didn't forget her. Susan promised that she would be a thorn in Mark's side. He didn't think she was showing. The last time they had sex was before January. He really thought that she would be showing. He rationalized that all the drugs she was using were keeping the baby small. They didn't come to a resolution, so Mark drove her back to the motel, and they went their separate ways for the night. The next day, Mark drove to Lexington again. And when the long work day was over, he returned to his motel room at 9 p.m. As he settled in, Ron Poole called and asked if he had talked stuff over with Susan. He told Ron that he had not, and he was too busy with the chop shop case. When they hung up the phone, Mark now realized that Kathy's warnings about Poole were correct. She told Mark that he was naive and that Poole would try to sink Mark because Ron wanted Susan. Mark had largely dismissed this and said FBI agents don't harm each other's careers. Mark woke up and was getting ready for another workday when Susan knocked on his motel room door wanting to talk. He told her that they would talk this weekend 
Susan needed to use his phone to call her sister, and she needed to borrow a pair of shorts. She had not brought enough clothes for her motel stay. Mark left her in his room and took off for Lexington. When he got back to the motel later that night, Susan was waiting for him, wanting to talk about the baby. She had been drinking, and Mark suspected that maybe she took some amphetamines. He told her that he couldn't talk, and he needed to spend time with the FBI's key witness, Charlie Trotter. Mark had to ensure that he kept up Charlie's nerve to testify. Mark spent some time with Charlie, then returned to his room. Susan was there, and she was agitated. She told him he screwed her life up since she met him. She was not having an abortion. Mark told her that if it was his baby, he and Kathy would raise it. Mark couldn't believe that slipped out of his mouth, and he immediately regretted it, because Susan was now making a scene. She was crying and saying how she was a good mother. Mark was worried that other people would hear, so he offered to take her on a ride to calm her down. They drove out of Pikeville and headed for the mountains. Susan wanted to know what that whore of a wife and his kids would think about Susan having his baby. She told him that Poole said the FBI will fire him when they find out. Susan spiraled out of control as they continued to drive. She lunged across the seat and slapped Mark. He did his best to maintain control of the car, turned off on a coal road, and pulled the car to a stop. Mark tried to calm her down again and wanted to work this out. She wasn't going to let him prance around Florida with his wife and spoiled kids. He owed her. When Mark told her to leave his family out of this, Susan said she was going to go to Florida and place her little Mark Jr. in his daughter's arms. His son will want to know why Susan's baby has the same name as him. Susan couldn't wait to see the look on Kathy's face. Kathy would leave him. Susan was going to go to the Miami FBI office and tell everyone he solved cases by sleeping with his informant. Mark had enough, and just wanted to know what Susan's demands were. So Susan said that when the baby is born, Mark was to be present and sign the birth certificate as the father. Next, he needed to leave that whore of a wife, Kathy, and leave those spoiled kids. He needed to marry her, else she would ruin his life. Mark's anger surfaced and he told Susan that if she ever called his wife a whore again, he would smack her. Susan said that he didn't have the balls to hit her because he wasn't a real man, and he was a bad lay. When Mark smacked her across the face, Susan never even flinched. She said that was the first real emotion she had seen in him, and hopefully it didn't hurt his delicate little hand. Mark was so emotional that he was almost hyperventilating now. Susan continued on, and said the only reason she worked with Mark was because she took pity on him, and now she owned him. She would have two little Putnam boys sucking on her breasts. Mark tried to regain his composure, and told her because she won't have an abortion, he would order a paternity test. Susan protested that she had not slept with anyone else. Mark said that's not what he heard. He continued that if the baby was his, Kathy and he would adopt it. Susan proved what type of mother she was by signing the custody of her kids to that drunk, abusive husband, Kenneth. He concluded by saying he would be damned if any kid of his would grow up to be a slut like her. Susan protested that she wouldn't let Mark's whore of a wife raise her kid. Mark told her that Kathy was a better mother than Susan would ever hope to be. And that was it. Susan was hysterical. She was now on top of Mark, beating him with her fists. He tried to pin her arms to get her to stop hitting him. She dug her fingernails into his eye. He took a swing at her. Instead of hitting Susan, his hand hit the windshield. She saw his bloody hand and bit it. He worked his hand free and grabbed her neck with both hands. He needed her to stop talking. Mark pressed on her neck for about two minutes. Susan stopped flailing around and was now quiet. Mark wanted to know if she would take it easy on him now. He wanted to drive her home. Susan slumped forward, and she appeared to be dead. Mark sobbed and could barely think. He went over the many scenarios in his head, from calling the state police to committing suicide. But no one had really seen them. No cars had driven past them. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do, 
so he lifted Susan's body out of the passenger seat, placed her in the trunk of his rental car, and drove back to the motel. Mark had scratches on his arms and jaw, his hands were bloody, and it was 3 a.m. Mark didn't sleep for the rest of that night. He got dressed that morning and drove to Lexington for work. No one mentioned anything about the scratches on Mark's body. Maybe they thought he went out on a bender the night before. After work, Mark pulled into the parking lot of the Pikeville State Police. Once again, he was conflicted about what he should do. So Mark left. He drove up to an area that wasn't well-traveled, but wasn't isolated either. Mark removed Susan's body from the trunk and took her down a ravine. He was crying and said sorry as he removed the shirt and shorts, which were his. When he climbed out of the ravine, a woman on a horse met him. All Mark could think to say was, Nature. The woman and horse galloped off without saying a word. Mark returned to the motel and put the clothes Susan had been wearing in the trash. He stopped at a service station, cleaned all the bloodstains off the dashboard, and vacuumed out his rental car. Mark stopped by their house to take care of a few things. He removed the floor mats, threw them in the trash, and also washed the car. There was a crack in the windshield, and when he returned the car, he told the clerk that a piece of coal had fallen off a truck and cracked it. Mark tied up loose ends before he left Florida. He called Susan's sister, Shelby, and asked if she had heard from Susan. Mark told her that if she didn't hear from her, to file a missing persons report. He called the Pikeville police and told them that he was worried about Susan, because she was supposed to meet some drug contacts from up north, and now she was missing. The state police were not that concerned. They told Mark that Susan had a habit of taking off, and Mark should know that. Shelby Ward called the police. She said that her sister checked into the Landmark Motel on June 5th, and the last time she talked with her sister was June 8th at noon. Instead of dismissing the situation, the experienced detective, Richard Ray, went out to Shelby's house to interview her in person. She revealed to him that her sister had been to the health center and had a positive pregnancy test. The father was Mark Putnam. He sensed that Shelby hated Mark, even though she had never met him in person. Shelby said Ron Poole had checked Susan into the Landmark Motel so she could confront Putnam about the pregnancy, and then she disappeared. Ray then visited Mark and gave him a copy of Susan's missing persons report. Ray watched Mark closely, and he was nervous, too cooperative even. Mark told Ray that Susan had many enemies, including Carl Cadiz Lockhart, his girlfriend Sherry Justice, who had beaten Susan up, and Kenneth Smith, her abusive ex-husband. Mark even mentioned that Kenneth called Kathy and told her that Mark and Susan were having sex. Putnam said that he spoke with Susan at the motel several times about her problems. They also discussed the possibility of Susan getting an abortion, but she did not want one, and she would not tell him who the father was. Detective Ray wanted to know why Susan was staying at the Landmark Motel. Mark told him that Susan was doing informant work with Poole. Ray interviewed Ron Poole, and Ron had the same concerns Mark did about Susan's enemies. Ray wanted to know why Ron put Susan up at the motel. Poole said that he wanted Mark and Susan to work out the pregnancy business because he was tired of hearing about it while Mark had been away in Florida. Ray thought Poole had been too forthright with his answers. Ray also knew that the FBI protects their own. But Susan had a reputation of running off and telling tales. Detective Richard Ray had no more leads, so Susan's missing person investigation sat idle. Mark was back in Miami, and Kathy was unmoved by the disappearance of Susan Daniels Smith. Kathy did what she could to help Susan when she lived in Kentucky, and really, there was nothing more she could do to fix Susan's life. Kathy settled into her new life in Florida, but she didn't really acknowledge some of the strange signs of stress her husband was exhibiting. He wasn't eating or sleeping. His urine had blood in it. He had daily diarrhea and lost weight. He had a nervous tick where he scratched his chest until he rubbed the skin raw. He also bought several newspapers daily and flipped through all of them. 
On Mark's 30th birthday, they called him into the director of the Miami Bureau's office. He would surely be arrested. Instead, Mark was handed a letter from the U.S. attorney from Kentucky, thanking him for all the fantastic work he did on the Chop Shop case. Ron Poole and Mark Putnam were still in contact. Ron told Mark that they need to stick together on this Susan thing. Mark wondered if Susan turned up dead, when law enforcement blame it on him or Poole. Susan had apparently told people she slept with Ron Poole, too. Detective Richard Ray contacted the man who called Susan when she stayed at the Landmark Motel. He was an old drug contact of Susan's from Milwaukee. He had not met up with Susan after she vanished and said she never returned his call. The drug contact said that an FBI agent named Poole called him looking for her. Ray knew that Susan was a complicated woman, but he learned that she was someone who always picked up the phone and called when she was away. She never forgot a card for a birthday or a holiday. In August, Ray asked Susan's sister, Shelby, to take a polygraph test. At first it insulted her, but she willingly took the test and passed. Detective Ray wanted to make sure that Shelby wasn't running a con. Ray's boss went to the FBI because they wanted Mark Putnam polygraphed. The FBI told them to look for Susan's ex-husband, Kenneth, and polygraph him. Detective Ray interviewed Kenneth, and he thought she went to Florida with Mark Putnam. Kenneth took three polygraph tests, which were all inconclusive because he had so many drugs in his system. Ray figured that Kenneth had no clue where Susan was and moved on. Charlie Trotter had been at the Landmark Motel when Susan and Mark were there. He told Detective Ray that there was nothing out of the ordinary going on, and Mark had been at work most of those days. Charlie thought Mark only saw Susan maybe a few minutes during that whole week. He said he didn't think Mark was fooling around with her. If anything, he was trying to avoid her. Ray didn't have any more suspects to interview, so he went to his boss again and said they need to strap Mark Putnam to a polygraph machine. They were unaware that, in Miami, Mark Putnam had been feeling so guilty that he offered to his supervisor to take a polygraph test. The FBI held firm that they would not offer their agents for interrogation because state police could not find Susan Smith. Ray's supervisor got tough with the Justice Department. He threatened to call Geraldo Rivera and have him investigate the FBI about the missing informant. This small threat was enough to get the FBI investigation into Susan's disappearance started. Agent Jim Huggins had 23 years in the FBI, and he worked out of the Lexington, Kentucky office. He considered the Pikeville situation an accident waiting to happen. A rookie agent with no supervision, with the workload of several agents, and a creep of a partner in Ron Poole the very Ron Poole who was transferred there because his supervisor didn't want to deal with him anymore. Jim took a few top agents from the FBI and headed to the Landmark Motel in Pikeville to start their investigation. All the agents read Detective Richard Ray's case file on Susan Smith. The FBI agents went around the room and gave their theories on Susan's disappearance. One agent thought it was Cat Eyes. Another thought it was the ex-husband, Kenneth. Another agent thought it was Mark Putnam. It shocked everyone in the room, but Mark had the motive and couldn't be ruled out. They all agreed to focus on Mark first. Mark knew that Jim Huggins and his team would sort this investigation out soon, and he would lose everything even though they really didn't have much of a case against him. There were no witnesses, no body, and no physical evidence. Mark left the Miami office on May 15th and went to the apartment that the FBI was renting for a sting operation. Mark Putnam sat on the couch and put his Smith & Wesson .357 up to his head. He changed his mind and put the gun down. He went back to the office and was informed that Agent Jim Huggins was arriving in Miami the next day. On May 16th, they called Mark into the conference room for his first interview with Jim Huggins and Richard Ray. They read Mark's Miranda rights, and he declined a lawyer. Mark went over everything, from how he started his career in Pikeville to where Susan was telling everyone who would listen that she and Mark were in a sexual relationship. Huggins asked Mark about Susan's age. 
he responded that she was 28. It surprised Huggins that Mark used the past tense, as if he were certain that Susan was dead. Mark went through his entire chronology with Susan. He told them that she showed up at his room at the Landmark Motel to tell him about her troubles. Then he made another mistake and said he became upset with Susan, but he said that he didn't hurt her. Well, this didn't appear to rattle any of the investigators in the room. They all knew Mark had made an error. They watched him for other signs of deceit. Mark offered strange details, like how he had cut his hand on a nail at his house as he was getting it ready to sell, and he bled all over his rental car. He said he kicked the windshield with his foot because he was angry over cutting his hand and lied about it to the rental company so they wouldn't charge him for it. Mark also lent his gym shorts and shirt to Susan. The interview had gone on for seven hours at this point, and everyone in the room knew Mark had killed her. Agent Jim Huggins wrapped up the interview for the day. He told Mark that they would start fresh the next day because there were problems with Mark's story. Mark went home and told Kathy about the interview. She was livid with Mark for mentioning the car and the broken windshield. Mark was so naive, and his offering extraneous details made him look guilty. The next morning, Kathy drove to the FBI office and wanted to give Jim Huggins a piece of her mind. They pissed Kathy off, and she demanded to be heard. She said this whole Pikeville thing almost tore her family apart, and that the FBI let this whole thing get out of hand. Where were they a year ago when Susan disappeared, and all the accusations were flying around? Kathy told them that they also needed to look at Poole, who has no business carrying a badge. She told Agent Huggins that she was part of an FBI drug sting that was aborted, and Poole had leaked that information to an informant. Huggins assured Kathy that he would look into her complaints, and he would resolve everything. Kathy went home, thinking she had cleared Mark's situation up, and they would stop questioning her husband. Mark was not as certain. Mark had agreed to take a polygraph test and flew out to Washington with Huggins to get that done. Doubts entered Kathy's mind again. She thought perhaps her husband slept with Susan. She thought about his issues with diarrhea and his chest scratching habit. Her mind began to race. Susan was probably carrying his baby. Then she thought about the cracked windshield in his rental car his bandaged hand, and the scratches around his neck. Maybe he knew something about Susan's disappearance. The phone rang, and it was Mark. He hadn't taken the polygraph test yet, and he wanted Kathy to know that it would not go well for him. Kathy wanted him to call her right away, no matter how the test went, and to not give them any statements. The polygraph test started, and only went a few minutes. The examiner stepped outside the room, and told Agent Huggins that there were major problems with Mark Putnam. The results were off the charts. Huggins told Mark that there were issues with his answers on the polygraph test. Mark wanted to speak to his wife before they continued. Kathy told Mark to fly home. The FBI allowed this since Mark was not under arrest. He flew home to Miami and told Kathy everything in a drawn-out, emotional conversation. Her husband killed Susan Daniels Smith. What was she going to do with the kids when Mark went to prison? Did he think about that when he killed her? Kathy called her parents the next morning and said that she needed them. Mark took the phone out of her hands and explained everything to his father-in-law. Mark also phoned his mom so she could hear it from him. Kathy and Mark left for the Miami office. He was ready to spill everything to the FBI Kathy wanted him to get a lawyer, which they did. The prosecution did not have a case, and they could not even file charges unless Mark gave them the details. After much back and forth, Mark's lawyer and the prosecutor hammered out a deal. Mark accepted first-degree manslaughter and agreed to serve 16 years in federal prison. There was also a stipulation he wouldn't be charged over the death of a fetus if Susan were in fact pregnant. Mark Putnam confessed to killing Susan Daniels Smith. He told them where her body was located. Law enforcement couldn't believe he placed Susan in such a moderately trafficked location where coal trucks operated next to the ravine 
and teenagers rode their dirt bikes through the trails. Mark said he placed Susan there because he wanted someone to find her. When police went out to the ravine, Susan was just a skeleton, but she still had on a gold chain with a tiny cross. When they finished collecting Susan's remains, one worker from the mining company said they were planning on abandoning the mine and bulldozing all the backfill into the ravine. A few more days, and Susan's remains would have been buried underneath 60 feet of rubble, and no one would have ever found her. The FBI located Mark's rental car and tore it apart. They found some blood on the seat cushion, but it matched neither Mark nor Susan. Prosecutor John Paul Runyon let Susan's sister, Shelby Ward, know that they found her remains, and that Mark Putnam confessed to the crime. The 16-year manslaughter charge upset Shelby. But they told her that without Mark's confession, there was no case. And 16 years is more than the average time served for a manslaughter conviction. The prosecutor knew that Shelby would likely be a problem down the road. After the grand jury handed down the indictment, Mark entered his guilty plea. Shelby Ward headed to the courtroom and was stopped when she set off the metal detector. They found a loaded thirty eight in her purse. She said she forgot it was in there. In front of a packed courtroom, Mark accepted the terms of his plea agreement. The courtroom proceedings lasted 20 minutes. Mark was cuffed and taken away. Susan's family denounced the outcome, and the media latched onto the story, which made life difficult for Prosecutor Runyon and the FBI. Shelby Ward had to deal with her legal problems for carrying a concealed weapon into a courtroom. Prior to this, Shelby had spent a lot of time trashing the prosecutor and the state police to the press every chance they gave her. Now, with a misdemeanor gun charge hanging over her head, she apologized and said the prosecutor did the best he could with the circumstances. Law enforcement was kind enough to drop the gun charge, and Shelby returned to bashing the prosecutor again. She publicly withdrew her apology to him. Mark was taken to a medium-security federal prison in Otisville, New York, and was eventually transferred to a federal prison in Rochester, Minnesota. Kathy sold their condo in Miami and moved the kids to Minnesota to be closer to their father. After about a year in Rochester, Kathy moved back to Connecticut so she could be closer to her parents so they could help with the kids. Kathy loved and supported her husband throughout his incarceration. Mark served 10 years of a 16-year sentence and was released in 2000. Ron Poole died the same year at age 50. There was an investigation into Ron's actions in relation to Susan Smith's death, which led to a further examination of the cases he handled. Ron Poole petitioned for a convicted killer to be released from jail, and that person committed multiple murders while he was Poole's informant. The FBI did not fire Ron Poole. He was suspended for a small time without pay and was demoted. Poole and Putnam's boss, who supervised the Pikeville office, was suspended without pay, but kept his job. This led the FBI to change their procedures for handling informants. Kathy Putnam died two years prior to Mark's release in the winter of 1998. She was only 38 years old, and her 13-year-old daughter discovered her body. Kathy had fallen into a deep depression with Mark's incarceration, and became a heavy drinker. She died of organ failure and a heart attack. Kathy's parents took custody of Danielle and Mark Jr. until they released Mark from prison. Kathy and her parents stood by Mark through everything. Susan's family sued Mark, and they were awarded $1 million in damages. Mark had filed bankruptcy and owned no assets, so he never paid the money. As an inmate, Mark had a perfect record and never caused problems. He said if he could take back those two minutes in the car with Susan, he would. Mark started a new life and remarried. He works as a personal trainer in Georgia. Susan's sister, Shelby Ward, ironically developed a phone friendship with Kathy Putnam when Kathy reached out to her after Mark went to prison. There were varying reports of what happened to Susan Smith's son, Brady. One source said someone shot and killed him in a drug deal. Another source said he overdosed on Xanax and methadone. Susan's daughter, Miranda, still lives in the Pikeville area 
she is married with a child. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Actress Amelia Clark, better known as the mother of dragons in the Game of Thrones, will play Susan Smith in a film called Above Suspicion that will be released sometime this year. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources and music used in this episode. There are many ways to support the show, which are listed on the website. And thanks for listening.